Hello, thank you for joining us. Welcome to this Texas Instruments Australia webinar tutorial event specifically tailored for Australian students studying the mathematical methods and specialist mathematics courses and using the TI-84CE technology. Uh, our panellist this evening is the highly experienced and expert Mr Peter Fox. Good evening Peter. Good evening Brian, how are you this evening? I am very well thank you and uh, looking forward to the clever things that you have to share with us. Uh, now Peter is a very experienced senior mathematics teacher uh, but is now currently working with Texas Instruments Australia and if you've looked on the web page he's the, he's the one who's designed that web page and also responsible for writing a lot of the materials that go onto it with the activities for, for lessons. Uh, now Peter I know is very passionate about appropriate use of technologies, particularly CAS, um, and are supported programs in Australia and New Zealand and I'm going to add to that actually worldwide, particularly in the United States. Meanwhile in the background you have me, I'm Brian, I'm your host and my latest project is coordinating the Texas T-Cubed Australia blog site, you see the address on your screen there, uh, and Quite excitingly, now we also have a new TI Australia student blog site. So the uh, the student hangout uh, be watching at the end of this event, and I'll give you some more information on that. I'm going to swap now across to Peter. Thanks, Brian. We'll get started straight away. We've got 10 tips in 40 minutes. I'll see if I can stick to the deadline. I'm sure Brian will give me a nudge if I start to run a little bit over. So we'll start with the first tip and it is using the Y equals editor to define functions. So by now I'm guessing most of the students listening this evening have probably used the Y equals editor to graph an equation. But you can also use it to define a function and even store functions and lock them away. If you're looking at the calculator, you might think it can store say 10 equations, but you'll see some tips later on this evening. That mean you can say more than 100 equations, which is pretty cool. I don't think you'll ever need all 100, but you can do it. So rather than just watch some stuff go along there or see examples, let's have a look at how you might use it to tackle a question. So our first question is, if f of x equals x plus 3 squared, determine the value of f of negative 2. So let me bring my calculator screen up. We'll go into the y equals editor and our function that we're given was x plus 3 all squared. Now normally you'd hit the graph button straight away. I'm going to go back to the calculator's home screen and there's two ways we can call up y1. And think of y1 as being a function, f of x. So if I press alpha and f4, I'll find our y1 up there. Or it's also tucked away in here under the variables and you can scoot across to Y variables and select option 1 for function and then Y1. So that method's a little bit slower. I kind of like the little um, alpha F4. And we're asked to evaluate F of negative 2. That's it. That was pretty quick. Of course, for that example, I would hope students would actually just substitute it in and look at it and work it out. But for more complicated equations, it's, it's a good way to do it. All right, so let's have a look at question two. In question two, determine the value or values, got to be careful, for which the function f of x has the value such that f of x equals five. So in this question, we're really being required to solve. Now I could solve directly, but you'll see as I work through the answer why it might be better to put it in as y1. So let's go back to the calculator. I'll go back into my y equals screen, just clear out the old equation. And luckily I've still got enough memory to know that that equation was eight minus x. And I'm just gonna arrow out from underneath that square root sign so that's the function, and we're asked to find out when does that function equal 5. Well, I could graph it, but here's how you might use it. 
using the solve command or our numerical solver. So a numerical solver is in the maths menu. And notice I just did up arrow once. And that's the quick way to get to the bottom of the menu. And I'll press enter. And our expression, you can see I've used it before. Our expression Y1 is popped in there. I'll just show you how you can do that. I can use the alpha F4 like I did before. Pop that in there. And then arrow down here. This is what I need Y1 to equal. And you'll notice on the bottom right hand side of the screen there's an OK looking button or we call it a soft key. It's directly above the graph or graph key. I'll press that one. It says X equals four or some sort of a residual of whatever's been in there before. So it says Y1 equals five. That's what I'm trying to solve. And look, our um, button, our soft key has changed to a solve. So I'll press enter on that one or rather press the graph key. And it says X equals negative 17. Now I'm just going to go back to the home screen and do what I did before. And here's a neat little trick. I can just arrow up and press enter. And now I can put in 17 or negative 17. So that seems to be correct. Of course, the beauty of the way we've done this, if I press the graph button, I could also see a graph of the function, depending on whether I'm in the right spot. I might have to zoom out a bit here depending on what my previous window settings were. I'll start with a zoom standard. That's not a bad window to choose and we can see it looks like there's only one solution. And our 17 is probably not such a bad one for the, um, uh, sorry, negative 17 is not such a bad one for the function equaling five. So that's using our y equals editor to, editor to define a function. That's it for the first tip. All right, tip number two. Let's have a look what we've got. GDB. And this is one that not a lot of people know about. GDB, whoops, is a shortcut for a graphical database. And I mentioned previously that you might want to store more than one equation in the calculator at a time. You might want to store 20 equations, but you've only got the option to set, set 10 in the Y equals editor. Or you might pop into another class and want to save the work you've been doing. Let's say you're in methods and you've gone off to a specialist math class. You might want to just save the graphs that you've been doing in the other class. So let's see what that looks like in the situation of a question. So we want to define the set of equations that pass through the points 0, 10 and 1, 0. We're assuming these are straight lines. Well, I'm going to. And 0, 9, 2, 0. And there seems to be a pattern here. There's a dot, dot, dot. So let's go ahead and start typing some equations in. So here I am back in the Y equals editor. Now, the first one was negative 10x plus 10. That would do what we are asked to do, going through 10 on the Y axis and 10 on the X axis, uh, one on the X axis rather. And the next one, and here's another little shortcut, alpha F1. I want to pick up the fraction key. So here I'm going to put negative 9 over 2 as my gradient. And X plus 9. So that's my second equation. Again, I'm going to use alpha F1 to pick up my fraction key. And negative 8 over 3. X plus eight, and I'm going to put in two more. If the students are following along with me, see if they can keep up. I'll see how fast I can go without making a mistake, shall I? Plus seven. Well, they might like to pop in the chat window and have a guess what the next equation might be. I don't think I've made any mistakes yet. I think we're all good plus six, that will do for now. And then I'll do a zoom. Let's just do zoom standard like we had before. And we can see the equations wrapping along there just quite nicely. Now, if I was to continue, I'd have a total of 10 equations here. 
The other thing I might want to do is just have a look at quadrant one. So I'm just going to trim my axes down a little bit. There we go. Now, imagine you're in class and the bell's just about to ring and you're heading off to another one where you might want to keep all of those equations and you don't really want to type them all in again. So this is what the graphical database does and here's how to do it. I'll go back to the home screen and then second draw and then across to store, S-T-O, and you can see option three, store GDB, which means store graphical database. And now it wants to know where I'd like to store it. I'm going to store that as graphical database number two. So I press the variable key, arrow down to GDB. And you can see I've got quite a few of them I can store. I'm just going to store it in number two. And I'm done. Not exciting yet. But let me go ahead and clear off all that good work. And let's just zoom in somewhere else. Like let's do a zoom, I don't know, zoom four. So now my window settings are different. My equations have all gone. And now I've come back to my, let's say, methods class. And I want those equations back. I can see I stored them in GDB2. So I'll go back through draw and under store you might have noticed recall GDB. I'll click the up arrow, press enter, and now it wants to know which one would you like to recall. I want to recall graphical database number two. I'll go back into my Y equals editor and it's kind of like, wow, that was magic. They're back. But check this out. So are the window settings. And there's my graphs back again. So GDB allows you to store up to 10 equations that are currently in the Y equals editor and also your window settings. So that can actually be used to save quite a lot of time. All right. What about some other questions though? What if we were doing something like some calculus, and don't worry too much if you don't know the calculus at this stage or what it means to have concavity. I'll throw a little definition up in just a second. But we're required in this question to determine the concavity of a function, e to the x on 2 sine x. Quite a bit of calculus, and we need to do that when x is equal to pi. So for those students um, perhaps doing some of the calculus already, for that, we'd need something called the second derivative. I'm going to do that on the calculator. And it says if the second derivative is positive, the function is said to be concave up. If the second derivative is negative, it's concave down. So I'll go back to the calculator. I'm going to clear all that stuff off. And I'm confident I can clear all these off too because... I know how to get them back. They're in the graphical database number two. Now, the function that we were given is e to the power of x over two times the sine of x. Now, for those students that are up on their calculus already, you'll notice that my calculator is set in radian mode, which it should be for a question such as this. Now, I'm going to do more on this bit later, this idea of a derivative. So don't panic just yet. But I want the derivative of the thing that's in Y1. I already know I can get that by pressing alpha F4. And I'm going to put an X here, which you'll find out why later on. That's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? I'll put an X so I can find out why. Um, and now I'm going to do the derivative of that thing. This is what we call the second derivative. I'm doing them one at a time a little bit slow catching up, so let me just chat while I'm waiting for that screen to catch up. Is it? Oh, there it goes. It's caught up. So don't worry about how all that stuff suddenly appeared on the calculator. I'm going to go through that shortly. But just remember that the question or the statement said that I need the second derivative. That's the thing that I have in Y3. 
I want the second derivative to be positive if it's concave up. Let's just go back to the notes. Second derivative is positive, says my function is concave up. Second derivative is negative, concave down. And I want to find out what that is at x equals pi. So I'm going to jump out there and I want to evaluate y3 when x equals pi. So you can see I'm making use of this idea of defining a function in the y equals editor. But how does this relate to a graphical database? Oh, I should answer the question. We can see that it's negative. So that says the derivative is negative. My function is concave down. And I'm going to have a look at what the function looks like at that point. You'll cover that in class. But how does this relate to a graphical database? Well, that took a while to type in the y2, the y3, all of that stuff. So let me just quit. And I'll do what I did before, second draw, go across to store, option three, graphical database. I don't want to save it as number two because I've used that one. So I'm going to put it in number one. So now if I get a question on concavity, I know that I can just recall graphical database number one and it's going to pop all of these in there. And of course, I can just change equation one to whatever else I want and know that the second derivative is already populated in my editor. Again, just to save time because all that other stuff took a bit of time to do. So graphical database was tip number two and it's all about saving time. Tip number three, what have we got? All right, group. Group to save variables to flash memory. Okay, what does that mean in the context of, say, normal day-to-day -day classes? You might have a problem-solving and modelling task, and within that problem-solving and modelling task, you might be asked to do some stuff. In this one, in my example, I said we might be modelling a roller coaster to determine the speed at various locations, and we're going to use a roller coaster program that's going to generate some data. We want to categorize the thrill level of the ride based on the, da uh, the data and then design our own roller coaster. So let's see what that might look like. All right. I happen to have a picture of a roller coaster. I think it's about picture number nine. Yes, that picture number eight. Almost missed it. So picture number eight is a roller coaster. And I'm going to set some window dimensions. These are some I thought of earlier. Let's see if they're reasonable. Now these are done just to get the scale roughly the same as what it is in the real world. So in the actual question, it's probably got some information about the distance between peaks or something along those lines. Oops, there's my graph going over. I forgot to clear my graph. Shame. Let's just clear them off. And I know I can get them back because they're in graphical database number one. So I might want to get some sort of a, a function in here to model my roller coaster. So if that's minus 80 and that's 80 over there. I'm going to do a, a quick trippy little thing here. X minus 80... Squared, that might pick up the one on the right hand side times x plus 80 squared. And this is going to be funny because you probably won't see the graph. Well, you, you can sort of see lines on either side. That's because it's just ridiculously big. It's, it's gone like off the screen. Having a look at that, I think it probably should be 70s. So let's just change those on to 70s. And what I'm trying to do is pick up the turning points it's hit pretty close to the axis. I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting the graph perfectly correct, but we can see that it, it, it's almost as though the graph's not there because it's ridiculously steep. But this peak in the middle, that's 10, 20, 30, 40, about 50 metres high. So what I do know is when Y1 
of a zero should give me 50. It doesn't. It's giving me this really big number. So what I'm going to do here is then just divide that or times it by 50 and then divide it by that quantity. So times by 50, put a dilation factor in other words. And I'm just going to recall. Here's another little tip. This is a bonus tip. Second, recall my last answer because I didn't bother writing it down. And look, there it is. And now I'll press graph. And my roller coaster ride's being simulated by this function. Only approximately, it needs a bit more work, but well, you can explore that later for yourselves. And then there's a program in here called Roller Coaster. And we might want to start the roller coaster ride at zero and finish it at about 70. And we'll go in steps of, say, five meters. And what this program is now doing is generating speed and time and all that sort of thing for various points on the ride. So it's populated some data in lists. So you can see there's lots of numbers in that list. I'm not going to worry what those numbers are for the time being. That's something for another tutorial. But what I do want to do now is save, save my work, basically. I've got this lovely equation sitting in my y equals editor. I've got all this data that I just generated. And I don't want to lose my roller coaster program. So second memory, this is the group thing. And under option number eight, we see group. And I'm going to create a new group. And I'll call it, and you can see my alpha character is flashing. So I can just press the keys, problem solving and modeling task. Press enter. And option two is the one I want to use this time. And I want to save my roller coaster program. And I want to save the stuff in list one, list two, list three, and list four. List five, I happen to know that I don't want that. And I want to save my equation. I might want to save my window settings as well. And look at that, I can save them. It's kind of cool. And then go across to done and press enter. And it says done. Let's see if it works. So we'll quit out of here. And we can see we've still got data in lists at the moment. But under the memory management, I'm just going to clear all my lists. It's kind of scary. So now list one and all the other lists indeed are all gone. There's invalid dimensions. There's nothing there. My equation, well, that's still there. Well, let's clear that off. In fact, let's um, just zoom in a different method. Then I've got a different window setting. So my group thing, second memory, option eight for group. Go across to ungroup, problem solving and modeling task, number two, override everything. And let's check the window settings. They're fixed. My equation's back. And lo and behold, so is all the data in the lists. So even though I cleared the list, cleared the equation, a whole lot comes back. So that's what a group file is for. If you want to save a whole lot of stuff, bundle it all into one box, it's a group file. It's kind of like file and save. All right, now, these next couple of tips are a little bit different and a lot quicker than what we've just seen. This one is about speeding up graphing. But there's a word of caution with this. The default graphing resolution is one so that you see the maximum detail that the calculator is able to provide. So we might be doing a question like we did before with the equations, for example. And we had a whole lot of equations. So let's go back to those. There's another chance to um, see what our memory is like. I want to get those equations back. If I recall, they were in. Graphical database, oops, not that one. I don't want to recall a picture. Second draw, cross to store, recall graphical database. And I'm pretty sure they're in graphical database number two. And there they are. Notice my window settings are fixed. Bring it back to here. 
I've still got this roller coaster right in the background, but let's not. Yeah, see, that's a little bit slow. So let's go down to here. And I'll change this to a three. See if you can notice any difference. That was kind of quicker, wasn't it? And that's not the delay in the, the webinar, our video feed here. It actually draws them faster. So I can change that out to a five. But again, you want to be careful because eventually you'll lose some of the resolution that you might need, points of discontinuity and so on. So really what it's doing is it's plotting every fifth point and then just connecting them. And that's why it's like five times quicker to draw the graph. But if you're just after a sense of where we're at, change your X resolution, particularly just at the stage where you're exploring, uh, because then you'll find that you can get the grass done a lot quicker, particularly if you've got a lot of grass happening. And yeah, we're possibly also off. getting away with it a bit, Peter, because they're linear, linear graphs. Yes, correct. Yes, Whereas, so you're right. If yeah, I change yeah. those to squares, then we might see some very chunky stuff happening very quickly. Yes, correct. Yeah. All right, so that was tip number four, X res. Worth knowing that that one sits in there. Just All on right. the roller coasters, Peter, I did yeah. type a, a link into the chat. Peter has uh, written a, a full article on the roller coasters and wine glasses, and that is published on one of the uh, blog sites. And I typed the link in. If you uh, scroll back through the chat, you will see that. Um, all right, so can you draw a family of curves? So as it happens, you can. I'm going to clear out these ones. And I'm going to use the same ones just so we kind of recognize and have an expectation of what's going on. Before I do, um, in my list editor, so I'll go stat, enter. I've got some values in there. I'm just going to clear those ones out. Go to the top and press clear, then enter. And I could write a sequence here, but you know what? I've only got 10 numbers. So I'm going to type them in. You probably hear me madly clicking away here. So I've got the numbers 1 to 10, so I'm going to draw 10 graphs using this list. This is what we call a parameter. So I'm going to write a fraction. And if you were watching before, I'm going to write this one as list 1 minus 11 over list 1. So when x is 1, that would give me negative 10 on 1, or in other words, negative 10. When, x is, uh, when L1 is 2, that would give me negative 9 over 2. In other words, the same graphs as what we had before. And list 1 minus, oops, no, I want 11 minus list 1. And... I'm going to change x res back to about 3, I think, is not a bad setting. Well, that's kind of pretty. So that's what we call a family of curves, or in this case, a family of straight lines. So you can use a list as a parameter where another example might be that you want to draw the line y equals x, y equals 2x, y equals 3x, y equals 4x. Or you might want to do some translations, x minus 1 all squared, x minus 2 all squared, and draw them all at once. Use a list. That's tip five. We're almost halfway through, and we're a little bit further than halfway through our time, so I'll accelerate just a little. Tip number six. This is the one that I sort of um, mentioned before, where we do something called a derivative. If you're in year 11 and you haven't done derivatives yet, then you might want to just come back and watch this video again later on. If you're in year 12, you've probably done some basic derivatives. So let's see how to do it. If you don't know, a derivative is essentially looking at the gradient of our function or the rate at which our function is changing. So I should pop up my question. My sample question here says, sketch a graph of the derivative of this function. And hence find the solutions to when the derivative is equal to zero. So let's see if we can do that. So my function is sine of 2x plus 2. Notice once again my calculator is set to radian mode. Important if you're doing calculus, you want to make sure you're in radian mode. So now, 
the important one here, this tip, is how do I draw the graph of a derivative? In other words, the graph of a gradient. You can see option eight is numerical derivative. Now on the calculator's home screen, this will calculate the gradient at one point. So I want to find the rate at which x, or sorry, which y is changing. So let's just go alpha f poor. The rate at which y is changing with respect to x. And on the calculator's home screen, I'd normally type just a numerical value in there. Here, I tell it I want that for all values of x. That's the syntax. So find the gradient of my function in y1 for all values of x. So I'm going to change my window settings a little because I think it's said between 0 and pi. I'll go to 2 pi just to have a look because you don't always have to stick to exactly the window settings. And we'll go in steps of pi on 2. And I'm thinking between negative. And make sure you use a negative sign. Often students will make a mess and I need to change that because it needs to go a bit higher. I'm thinking. And I'm going to set my x-res back to 1. So I'm only drawing the one graph. So there's my gradient function. And I want to know when does it equal 0. And I'm asked to do that. Let's go back to the question. Between 0 and pi. Well, my window settings goes to 2 pi. So... I need to be careful here. That looks as though there's two answers. I want to know when does that red curve cross this axis. Now, there's two ways I can do that. I'll demonstrate one. Second calc, zero. Which function do I want? Well, it's on the blue one at the moment. I don't want that one. I want the red one. So I can arrow down, and you'll see it changes to my derivative function. So find a point to the left, done that, and I'll press enter. Find a point to the right, done that, press enter. I think that Fussy wants a guess as well. Does it want me to do everything? But there's a solution. X is equal to 2.35. Now, let's compare that to just going into the math menu as we did before and looking at the numerical solving. I want to find when Y2... So I'll go and get y2. When does y2 equal 0? And my soft key above the graph. And it's you can see it's actually picked up the old value of x, the one that just had on the calculator, on the graph page. So I'm going to change that to, say, 0.2, just to find somewhere different. And notice, if I wanted to, I could put boundaries in here as well. So I could say between 0 and, let's say... Pi. Now, I know I've already found one. And then just go back onto here and hit Solve. And you can see it's giving me that one. Now, imagine if this is the only spot you were doing this in, you may not have realised there's more than one solution. And that's why it's important to have a look at the graph so that you can see and get some sort of an expectation on how many solutions you might be looking for. So that's using the um, numerical derivative to draw the graph, uh, or rather a graph to draw the numerical derivative, the other way around. All right. That was tip six. Tip number seven. That's kind of the opposite. Numerical integral, that is the antiderivative of a function. So in other words, it's actually the area under a curve. What sort of question might we get? Determine the area bounded by the curve. Now, that's a particularly nasty one, because if you try and do the antiderivative of log x, that's a bit of a challenge, but the calculator will do it as a numerical effort, and we want to do it between 1 and 3. Well, let's do that first, just to see how that's done. If I go back into here, I'll clear that equation off, clear that one, I don't need that one, and I could just put in my function, which was the log of x, this one, and it said, find the area between 1 and 3. So let's do that. Second, calc. And option number 7 is area or integral. And I want lower limit, 1. Upper limit, 3. 
enter, and there it is. So it's given me an answer, 1.29 something. That was easy, didn't have to do much. But let's have a look at a question slightly different. Oops, there it comes. Now it says, determine the value of A such that the area bounded by looks almost the same is equal to E. So it's actually saying that thing that I got before that area, it says do it between one and some other value so that that area is equal to E. E is about 2.718. So I could just guess and guess and guess, but that's going to be slow. So let's try something different. I, I know what the graph looks like. I don't need to see the graph. What I want to see is the graph of the area function. So again, maths, and then I'll do finite integral, and I'll go from 1 to x of whatever. I've typed in y1. You can see I make a lot of use of having my function defined in this y equals editor. So if I press graph now, I'm not going to go into the details as to why that dips first. Just understand that it does. But I want to find it so that the area... Now, this is a graph of the area function. And I want to know when does that area function equal E. So it's this. This is pretty easy. I can just go into here, and I can put my value for E. And graph it. And now all I need to do is find out where those two graphs intersect. Second calc. Point of intersection, first curve, second curve, yes. And it says it's at 4.1235. And for those people that are interested, I did this on a CAS calculator, that is a calculator that's capable of doing algebra and doing definite integrals, and it gave me exactly the same answer to about seven decimal places because it had to do it approximately as well. So that's solving using a combination of our tips, but also using this idea that we can put the numerical integral in as a function. Now, this is not one you're going to use on an exam, this one that you're going to see now. This is actually just a transformation application, and you can see it's sort of populating the screen there at the moment. So if you're into translating functions, then you can do that. I'm just watching the time. I'm going to do a slightly different function. You've probably done quadratics. So I'm going to do a different function, a really weird one. This one's called the normal distribution. So that's it. And I can paste that into there. Now, what if, so this first value, that's called the mean. This one is called the standard deviation. I'm going to put a little a in there, and it would use the current value stored in a, except I'm going to use this thing called transformation. And again, this is not something you'd use in an exam. This is something you might use in class when you're doing some exploration. You can see that I've got some, or oh, another option up here. I'll go from negative 4 to 4. I'll use a scale of 1. And we'll go, let's say, from 0 to 1, uh, 0.5. We can be fairly accurate with this. Oops. Fairly accurate with this graph. Now I'm going to go up, and I'm going to go across to settings. And I'm going to set A equal to 1. That would be our typical standard deviation. And I'll set the step size as 0.1. You can see our soft key for the graph, so I'll press that one. That's what a normal curve looks like. It's called a bell-shaped curve. I want to see what happens to my curve as I change the standard deviation. So I just use the arrow keys, and you can see that the graph is changing according to the value of A. So you can do it with parabolas. You can do it with straight line graphs. Much any function you want to transform, hence its name, transformation. But I can actually see what it's doing. You can animate them. You can leave trails on. So in other words, you could um, get it to leave a series of graphs. You can get it to play and pause. I'm not going to do those now, but I do encourage you to play around with the transformation graph because uh, transformation 
app because it's very powerful. But when you finish, make sure you turn it off. So quit. Because when it's on, you can only draw two graphs at a time. Tip number nine. Uh-oh, my computer's slowing down a little bit. There we go. Um, the function keys, they contain a great deal of shortcuts. Let's have a quick look at some of them. We've seen the alpha F4. We've also seen the alpha F1 to pick up a fraction. And there's some more here. A lot of those commands are available in the maths menu, but that's a very common collection of them. One over here that I really like is the matrix. Now I know you can go in and define a matrix using the matrix command, but what this does is allow you to put a matrix anywhere you like, which means you can put a matrix in the Y equals editor and have variables. So for those students doing specialist math, think about that in the context of vectors. You can have vector equations put in here and do the dot product of them and those sorts of things. But that's something for a whole other session. So check out those alpha, F1, F2, F3, and F4. They contain a lot of really cool shortcuts. Now, tip number 10, our last one. And, and I've got about two minutes to show it, I believe. All right, so let's see how quick I can go. When you're setting up the calculator, you can choose the default settings. But from time to time, things kind of get messed up. Um, and you might be in complex mode if you're in specialist maths and you know, all sorts of weird stuff can go on. Um, so it's sometimes it's handy to have everything go back to a particular state. So here's your fastest lesson in programming ever. I press the program button, I go across to new, and we can see our alpha keys flashing. So I'm gonna call this program setup. And now I'm going to pretend that I'm just choosing the sorts of things I would normally have when I'm working in, let's say, my math methods class. And I might want functions on rather than parametric. I might have had them on for um, specialist maths. I want the graphs drawn sequentially. I want my calculator in real mode. You can also set your window settings to whatever you like because you can access any of the variables. They're all in here, all your window settings and so on. They're all in there. So what? I've written a program. You can see my program called Setup. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change a few things. So I'm going to change across to Scientific. I'm going to change to Degree Mode. In other words, I've been mucking around in class. Oh, no, you wouldn't do that. Um, and complex mode. So I'm wondering why that's there. And I'm wondering why this A plus B I is there. And I want it in radians. So here's the cool thing. I just go to program, to set up, and everything's back to normal. All those window settings um, that I might have set. See how it's in radian mode now? It's back to function. It's back to real mode. Everything that I set up in that program is automatically launched and done. So it's a good program to create. Find out what your favorite settings are. You're in the middle of an exam or a test, and all of a sudden your calculator's got all these weird settings on it. You just want it back to normal. Write your own setup program. Experiment it with it during the year and fine tune it. Speaking of fine tuning, I've gone two minutes over, Brian, so I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Peter. Um, you know, mate, as, as much as I reckon I know that calculator very well, I still learn things, uh, and that's, uh, that's the value of our T-Cube trainer network, because um, different people will think of different things. Of course, I know how to set up the calculator. Of course, I know how to do programming. I'd never, it had never occurred to me to put the two of them together. Clever stuff. Um, if any attendees would like to send a question directly to Peter, you can do so now or just uh, maybe a word of thanks for what he has shared with us this evening. When I close the event, which I will do so shortly, we'll go to that feedback page. Um, perhaps the most important thing to write in there is what would you like to see in more of these tutorials? What would you like to see more of? 
How can we best support you? Some attendees asked, is this being recorded? The answer is yes, and you can view it again either through our on-demand webinars on the Texas Instruments website or through our YouTube channel. Or here's a new option for you, the um, TI Australia Student Hangout. Uh, note down that web address, tistudents.wordpress.com. That will link you through to copies of these recordings and also provide you with notifications of what's coming up next in the program. So some great ideas there from our presenter, Peter. Thank you uh, very much to Peter. Thank you also to all your attendees and uh, good evening to all. <laughs>